welcome back to the game room. Let's talk cables. Reviewing cables is always a weird time since by default the only real question you'd ever have to ask is, does it work? When it comes to discussing cables that make objects do things they aren't supposed to, it gets a bit more complicated. Such is the case with Pound Technologies HDMI cable for the PlayStation and the PlayStation 2. Other YouTubers have already chimed in on how it handles on the PS2, but since you're watching me, you know this is going to be all about the PlayStation and its games. Let's get you introduced to the cable first. Created and produced by Pound Technology, who have lovingly lifted Konami's original logo for their own purposes, and originally appeared uh, exclusive through Limited Run Games. It's an almost all-in-one upscaler and HDMI cord allowing you to hook up that 25-year-old PlayStation deck to your modern-day TV. The component comes in three pieces. The upscale box, the 6-foot USB power cord, and an almost 6-foot HDMI cord. Along with the box and shipping baggies is a little quick start guide for the PS2 folk, letting them know of some steps they may need, may need to take to make it look right. Hooking up the cables requires three steps. First, obviously plugging into the back of the PlayStation, where it has a pretty firm grip on the port, especially on the PlayStation 1. Second, connecting the HDMI cord to both the box and the television, and finally connecting the USB cord to a USB port for power. If you're using it on a PlayStation 2, you can just plug it right into the system's front USB ports. With the original hardware, however, you'll need to either plug it into the TV or an external power supply. More on that later. Once everything is hooked up, the system side of things is all set. It's here on the television, more specifically your television, where the true feelings on the cable will be decided. We'll start with what is arguably, arguably my only real complaint about the product before it ever arrived on my door the lack of standard ratio, or 4x3 mode. The PlayStation and all systems prior to it were designed with this ratio in mind thanks to the way TVs were set up at the time, and when the system is turned on to a modern TV, it will stretch horizontally to fit the widescreen image. That is unless you have a standard mode option on said television. This feature is hit or miss and will more than likely be the lone deciding factor for many buyers. In my testing across three televisions and a computer monitor, only one of them allowed me the option, and that TV was the one I only just recently inherited, so I might not have even had it. As for resolution, the cable upscales a 720 progressive. No more, no less. If a game on the PlayStation 2 supports something higher, it will force it down to 720. This decision to not support any progressive has also been a sore spot for folks, but it really wasn't for me, and it became even less of an issue after a previously tweeted observation I made a few days ago, prior to this video's recording. An observation that I'll discuss right now, but first, you'll need to see what I see to understand the revelation. While I'm discussing my setup, you'll be able to see the comparison videos of both my current setup and the new cable. In the game room, I have two setups. A PlayStation that is doing SCART through component to a CRT TV, which admittedly is probably overkill, and then a SCART to HDMI hookup I use for video recording. The HDMI upscaler I use for video production also does not support a 4x3 option, so when I'm adding videos to these reviews, I need to manually scale them back to the proper aspect ratio. The reason for using a European SCART cable is that it provides a much richer color source with a deeper color saturation. The trade-off, regretfully, besides the lack of a proper ratio, is that in 1080 Progressive, PlayStation games can look a bit... Lego-like. This is especially true in 2D games, since the pixel artwork is so supersized, it reveals the true stair-like curves of characters and the many developer visual tricks that you'd never have known in its original time frame. The biggest visual trick is the use of checkerboarding pixels to create new colors and transparency. Perfectly illustrated in this Darkstalker screenshot, you can see in Felicia's hair that Capcom used a checkerboarding mesh of two different colors that would bleed together by monitors and CRT 2s resolutions into a third color. At 1080 progressive and soaking in some extra saturation, this becomes glaringly obvious. When presented through the Pound Tech cable, however, the checkerboarding tricks are almost hidden again, giving you a glimpse into what the games were intended to look like just at a higher resolution. This moment of, if you'll pardon the pun, clarity hit me fairly hard. After four years of viewing games in a super high resolution, I'd forgotten what they looked like originally. I was suddenly 19 again, and I'm not kidding when I say this, that this new view on life hit me so hard, I forgot I was supposed to be reviewing the cable and just sat there playing for 20 minutes. I love this. Would it, it, would, would it have been nice to kick it up to 1080p? Yes, but seeing something as it was intended 
20 years later is still really breathtaking. So with that in mind, I tested my cables and my PlayStation and PS1 decks across a sharp 4K television, an older Toshiba widescreen, the PlayStation 3D monitor, and my still trusty HP 2207H monitor. Of the four test units, only the Toshiba allowed me to change the aspect ratio. We'll save that one for last, but we'll start with the sharp TV in the living room. This was probably the biggest shock of all four test units because I was expecting it to look amazing. It is, after all, a modern day high resolution TV. Instead, it looked really good despite being stretched into 16 by nine mode. At first, it looked way too fuzzy, but a quick inventory of the actual TV settings revealed that my sharpness level was set ridiculously low. With that adjusted, I found myself decently impressed with it. My only real complaint would be that it does this, that my TV does that weird thing where it smooths the pixels like some of the modern day compilation discs have, and it was just, meh. The Sharp also has two built-in USB ports, so power was fine. Moving into the game room, the Sony 3D monitor was next, and for those of you who adopted one second hand and don't know it, it does have a USB port hidden on the back left side, on the underbelly of the well. You will need to pop a little door port to get access to it. With cord plugged in and powered, I was once again denied a 4x3 setting, but found the picture quality good, if perhaps a bit subdued. If you're using a Sony 3D monitor, you will need to play with the color adjustments to get the look you want. At this point, I remembered my HP monitor that I used as a second screen wasn't using its HDMI port, but doesn't have a powered USB hub. So I plugged the HDMI into the monitor and the USB cord into the Mac since it was on, and it worked just fine. The HP monitor I've had for a long time, and I love it because it rotates to support tape mode and shooters like Raiden Project. Like the 3D monitor, the image was still stretched and slightly subdued, but it was extremely clean. I could see playing on this with no real issues. Finally, my Toshiba. Since the TV supports 4x3 mode, I was gleefully waiting to see what it would finally look like in its proper format, only to then realize there's no USB port on the set. Rather than use a plug adapter, I just had my laptop sit next to it and use that for the power source. If you're wondering why I wouldn't have just used the adapter as some, like Metal Jesus illustrated, it's because of a single sentence on Pound's website. Quote, If you're playing on a PlayStation 1, we recommend plugging it directly into your TV to avoid the unnecessary power draw of a wall adapter. What unnecessary power draw of a wall adapter? Is this trying to avoid potential issues like the GameCube HDMI cable that zapped a deck because two wrong connectors touched? Is this supposed to be read in the same voice I read that a $100 collector cartridge could set your Super Nintendo on fire and you should have a fire extinguisher handy? What does that mean? If I turned the system off, couldn't I just unplug the cord and it would avoid the draw? What draw is happening when the system's on? <sighs> That rant aside, it's here on the final TV that Pound's cable comes alive, like they intended it to be and how you dreamed it would be. Colors are rich, the now reinstated developer visual tricks shine brightly once again, and the HDMI's audio quality is excellent. Across all TVs, I specifically use Soul Blade for the textures and saturation comparison, Soul Reaver for audio and textures, Chrono Cross for its resolution swap between menu and gameplays, it was fine, Darkstalkers and Rayman 1 for sprite review, and several other random titles. All featured games, including the lesser ones I haven't mentioned, played beautifully with the vibrancy you'd want out of a 720 signal. After several rounds in Street Fighter Alpha 3, Darkstalkers, and Pandemonium, I also couldn't detect any real lag. I'm sure there's at least some minimally somewhere, but honestly, I don't know where it is. Which brings us to a humorous moment. Of any game you'd want to test lag on, it would be a musical game like Parappa the Rapper. Musical games on later generation systems had built in lag testers to make sure you were always on the right note. After not being able to clear the freaking practice stage, I decided to prove a point and hooked my PlayStation's original AV cables up to my old CRT TV's AV cords, and wouldn't you know it, I couldn't get past the practice stage. Turns out all these years, it's not the lag that's been killing me. I, I, I'm just not really good at prep of the rapper. <laughs> so after 10 hours across multiple televisions and PlayStation models, the only question is, is the cable worth it? Yes, but you need to approach it like PC requirements of a Steam game. If your TV has support for a 4x3 mode and a USB port on it, you will get the full enjoyment of the product as it was intended. 
If you answered no to either of those questions, you can still use it, but you may not have the same enjoyment as you did if you had. Despite the bizarre power warning and the poor business decision to not include or even force a 4x3 ratio, the Pound Technology HDMI cable is a fantastic accessory wounded only by its creator's decisions and to a degree your own television settings. On the positive side, the cable's $30 price point and ample cord lengths are a steal for a device of this nature. Consider that, it's, that it seems to use a similar upscaler that my SCART box uses, but in order to get that setup working, it cost me roughly $80 to $100, and it still has the shortcomings of the $30 cable. So essentially, you can save yourself $70 if you have no need for extra color saturation and 1080p. It's even more attractive when you compare it to options like the OSSC and other scanline devices. As it stands in its current form, the final Game Rave review for the Pound Technology Cable is a solid 7 out of 10. The price point can't be beat, and there are always ways around its shortcomings so long as your TV has the options. If it had included the 4x3 aspect or option and the ability to upscale to 1080p, it'd be an easy 9 out of 10. I do look forward to reviewing their upcoming cable for the TurboGrafx-16, and I'm assuming I'll be able to just reread this script with just the names being changed on the games I used. Next time, I'll be able to finally discuss the long, long requested game review and even more importantly talk about the rabbit hole of a journey I went through to get there. It's going to be a hoot. I'll see you then. Take care, you guys.